Prohibition Questions Answered by Ernest W. Mandeville The Outlook July 22, 1925 Since early in February, I have been reporting to you the results of my investigations into the enforcements and effects of Prohibition. Two of my articles dwelt on the bright spots of our five years under the Volstead Act. In the rest of the series, the failures of enforcement and the accompanying evils weighed heavy. This, I believe, is proportionately a fair picture for the section of the country that I covered. Although many of my conclusions have been stated throughout the series, especially in the first two installments, I think that this concluding article may well be devoted to the answering of pertinent questions which have been put to me on the problem as a whole. First, has the Prohibition Law been a success? In answer to this question, I must make a distinction between a prohibition law actually enforced on a par with other laws, and a law which is publicly flouted by great numbers in the various grades of society with comparatively little efficient action taken to prevent violations. I strongly feel that the prohibition law cannot be rightfully judged until it is given a fair test under real enforcement. Then only can we tell whether or not it would work the great benefits that were hoped for by its enactors. I think that, in the main, it would. I will discuss the possibility of real enforcement later. My study leads me to the conclusion that the enforcement record for the past five years has been a bad one. Liquor has been easy to get for those who wanted it. The quality of the drink, however, has been lowered all around, and brought down almost to the straight poison stage for the cheap buyer. A goodly proportion of our population who live respectable lives and who obey other laws as a matter of principle, disregard the Volstead Act, and either continue their tippling as if there were no law, or go to further extremes in drinking in the spirit of spite against the restriction. A new class of drinkers has been created. The small town society set goes in for boozing now as the thing to do. Young folks, following after their elders, have taken to hard liquor as never before through smartness and the feeling of deviltry and breaking bounds. A highly organized underground liquor traffic has been built up. Trickery and deceit have been fostered. A new criminal class has come into being. It is a large one, and consists of many who could not have been entangled in other criminal pursuits. Officers of the law in large numbers disobey this law themselves, and wink at the violations of it. Local authorities, in many cases, take no interest in the enforcement of the prohibition law. They prefer to disregard it as their duty and pass on the responsibility to the state. Many states, officially or unofficially, take the attitude that a federal law is to be enforced by the federal authorities, and the buck is passed once more to the federal government. The federal authorities have been unable to cope with the situation. Their effort has not been a wholehearted one, and as General Andrews, the new enforcement head, says, the matter has been more or less treated as a joke in Washington. The results of prohibition under such unfortunate conditions have been both bad and good, mostly the former. But if under such farcical enforcement the benefits described in my articles of March 25th and April 1st have been produced, it seems reasonable to think that real enforcement would transform an unsuccessful law into a glowing success. The guilt so far must be put upon the enforcement of the law, and not upon the law itself. It must be said that enforcement conditions in the past five years have grown worse rather than better. However, it seems that there is some hope now for an improvement all around. This leads me to the next questions. How can the law be better enforced? And can it ever be well enforced? The first of these questions I covered rather fully in my article of July 15th. The needs are, generally speaking, much larger money appropriations for the purpose of enforcement and the official determination to see the job done. The money will provide more enforcement agents, and salaries can be paid which will attract incorruptible men of intelligence and ability. The will of the leaders to obtain results and an efficient staff will bring results. If the sources of supply are dried up, which is within the range of possibility, the problem will be largely solved. This cannot be done until the official mind is made up, and the enforcement unit is properly manned. At the present time, it seems to me that it is of more importance to prosecute the crooked government agent who is promoting the trade he has taken vows to obliterate than it is to catch individual bootleggers. Politics must be removed from prohibition enforcement. 
The people must be educated in the importance of obedience to the law. As long as the people want illicit drinks, there is bound to be a traffic in them. The bootlegger sells whiskey only where the people want him to. The mind of the public must be made to realize the damage that is being done by their attitude. In my estimation, the most serious danger from a state of affairs such as we have today is the gradual breakdown of our democratic system. Courts are being demoralized, and once graft seeps through the official system for one purpose, the officials are limited in their usefulness in other ways. Corrupted for one purpose with fear of exposure, they cannot take strong stands on any measures. When the public is made to see the dangers, I feel we shall get more of the common consent which enables the authorities almost automatically to enforce other laws. Once Americans realize that conditions are deplorable, they usually get into action and see that matters are corrected. Therefore, I believe that a series of fact articles such as this one is a means of bringing reform. The facts may be unpleasant and disquieting, but the sooner we know them, the sooner we can set about a cure. Some ardent dries promote the policy of keeping blinders on our eyes. We are to see only the good. We are to disbelieve all criticism and denounce it as wet propaganda. These people, in my mind, are unconsciously hurting their cause more than anyone else. The public must know of the existing evils before it will be moved to act. It must face the facts before it can act intelligently. Exposures of local conditions in various parts of the country that have been made in this series have caused some protests, but they have also led in several cities to actual improvement, to official and public action for correction. I am glad to see that people the country over are gradually coming around to the policy of facing the facts. The Iowa Anti-Saloon League report is an indication of that powerful organization's willingness to face things as they are, even though they are bad. If dry organizations would aid in making the general public realize the really deplorable state of affairs and urge betterment, improvement would come the faster. The churches are becoming more willing to look into actual conditions. Soon, I hope, we will all wake up to the sorry condition of the liquor drinking problem in this country. Whether or not there can ever be enforcement which compares with that of other criminal laws, I am not prepared to say. All one can do is to figure the costs, weigh the possibilities of getting this large amount annually, for spasmodic efforts are of little value, and then conjecture whether it can be hoped for. I believe that the job can be done, but I cannot predict, under the circumstances, whether the public mind will eventually sway towards action or inaction. Is the law likely to be repealed? I think not. Hardly any student of the problem sees any chance of repeal. Unless enforcement becomes a reality, the most probable turn of affairs will be the nullification of the law. In that case, it will be left on the statute books, but generally disregarded, as some of our laws are. The ostrich policy of closing one's eyes to the faults will surely bring either nullification or modification. The people of this country should demand either enforcement, modification, or repeal, for indecision means the endangering of all other laws. Scarcely anyone wants a return to the old abuses of the corner saloon. Many, however, want a correction of the newborn abuses of the hypocritical speakeasy. Do the people of the country want prohibition? There is little doubt in my mind that the majority of citizens want a prohibitionary liquor law. Even in the wet sections of the country, there is more public sentiment in favor of law enforcement than we dream of. Massachusetts recently showed by vote that even in that state, which cannot by any means be considered dry, a great majority of the citizens are outraged by the open disregard for the law. The women of the country are for the most part, I believe, in favor of prohibition. However, public opinion is not a fixed quantity. The balance of power may shift about unless there is enforcement of the present law, or unless the present law is made enforceable. Then, too, there is a large public sentiment against prohibition. It is this that makes the law hard to enforce. But this may change, too. Sentiment against drinking has grown rapidly during the last century. One hundred years ago, criticisms began to spring up because some of the clergymen used to get drunk together at their conventions. Colleges knew nothing of temperance. Societies sprang up during the century campaigning against this drink and that. Licenses became harder to get. 
closing hours were enacted. The law became stricter and stricter. The West went dry, then the South, then the whole country. So, with favorable conditions, the progress of public sentiment would be likely to go on. But it may be that the unfavorable conditions of the Prohibition experiment to date may drive sentiment the other way. Is there more or less drinking than before Prohibition? There are no trustworthy statistics upon which to base a conclusive answer. My opinion is that the volume of drinking is considerably less than before Prohibition. However, the present method of distribution leads to drinking too much and too fast. There is, I think, in certain classes of society, more drinking to excess than formerly. Is not the passing of a sumptuary law an unjust limitation of the personal liberty which is every individual's right? I suppose that most of us are opposed to sumptuary legislation which interferes with habits that belong absolutely to our individual lives. But the habit of drinking intoxicating liquors may be held to overflow the bounds of one's individual life. I cannot agree that the 18th Amendment is sumptuary legislation. It is social legislation. The state must, for social welfare, dictate whether or not an individual may drink certain beverages when the individual under the effect of that drink affects society at large. When liquor becomes dangerous to public safety, society must be saved by law from such a menace. When the weaknesses of the people are preyed upon for profit, as in the saloon trade, when poverty and crimes are furthered by a habit-forming beverage, when lives of people are endangered by drunken drivers, when these things and many others follow in the wake of the liquor traffic, it must be legislated against. By the same token, however, a law which either from careless enforcement or from the impossibility of enforcement is carrying with it hypocrisy, deceit, corruption, crime, and many other evils, that too, for the good of society, must be repealed or amended. In brief, it seems to me that we must first enforce and then judge whether or not modification is advisable.